Hey guys, Matt from Pangea here. I've got Tom from Gecological and I've got Anthony from Little Monsters. They've been working on a project to help us kind of understand crested gecko genetics a little better. Um, I'm gonna let them kind of tell you what it's all about and we'll go from there. Yep, so we've been talking for months. We've been brainstorming, looking at the basics of crested geckos, going back to the wild types and we're coming up with this formula that's working well. We wanna bring it to the community and get input from the community. And what we really wanna do is, well, what we're building is the foundation genetics for crested geckos. Awesome, all right. Do you wanna elaborate a little bit on incomplete dominance, which I know there's a lot of misunderstanding about uh, in the hobby, either one of you or both of you? Go ahead. Yeah, so, so go ahead, Tom, if you wanna take <laughs> it real quick. Well, co-dominance was always what everybody called everything, it seemed like under the sun for the most part. Yep. Started with the ball python industry. Exactly. They still use it. Some people will continue to use it. They <laughs> make no bones about it. For sure. But incomplete dominance is different and it's pretty much what they call codom in the ball python world. So yeah, it's the correct term basically. The correct term for the and, same thing. And that's something we had discourse about when we met. <laughs> uh, yes. we were looking we were looking at soft scales. <laughs> and he showed a picture and it has to have this yeah. and I'm like, well, I have some, Okay. you know, I got them from you right? and it doesn't match exactly. And then he mentioned codom in order to communicate properly with the community. And I was like, knock it off, knock it off. You know what so I mean? It's, it's, it's like, a little bit of a semantic <laughs> argument. It's not codominant, it's incomplete dominant. That was my first time I was like, oh, okay. So you know what you're talking about. Yep. Well, yeah, yes, good. it is incomplete dominant, but like 80% of the community doesn't understand it. So they understand codominant. So I used that verbiage and I struggled writing it too. I was just like, I don't want to write this, but I also don't want to write a big explanation on what it is. So that, you know, that way just to keep the conversation going and have people look at it since they understand that co-dominance is actually incomplete dominance. Yeah, so co-dominance, you actually need the matriarchal and patriarchal, you need a contribution from both. Uh -huh. Just like so you are- Traits from both are being expressed. Right, okay. so like co-parenting. Yeah. Right? And incomplete. So you need it from both, yeah. incomplete, Incomplete blends things. Incomplete, you don't need it from both sides. Okay, understood. That's the, I think. <laughs> that's the bare bones, simple yeah. explanation. All right. And when you yeah. blend, depending on the strength of other genes, you might you can actually breed it out of the animal to where you aren't visually seeing it. It might be there, or it has been there forever. The remnants right? of it. Yeah. Yep. So it, it tends to disappear where we don't see it visually as people, but it may still be yeah. in these animals. Gotcha. So what are some traits that you guys have um, been able to kind of figure out to some extent that you think is has not really been a known thing in the hobby? Uh, great example, tiger. Tiger. Yep. Tiger wipes out a lot of things we think are in the <laughs> industry. So you talk about reverse pinstripe. This is the number one thing that it's just going to, it just destroys, right? Mm -hmm. You have something that is not a pinstripe. That reverse is not pin stripe. It's completely different. Okay. So when you have traits interacting, especially pin stripe yep. in an animal, the original normal pin striping trait, it is so strong because of how we bred these animals. Gotcha. Just we, we visually see it, we've bred them, we've yeah. stacked this, right? Yep. We've we've built this gene that acts more dominant because we've layered it. Okay. So it's like that building makes sense. blocks. Yeah. It's, Okay, yeah, yeah. That, so, makes, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. So what happens is you also have that mid-lateral line that comes in when you get quadding. Mm -hmm. And that is there for a lot of different things that we're going to talk about or that we see. Yeah. So it's, it's very important. So when you put tiger in an animal that has strong pin, mm -hmm. it forces it off the back and makes it run along the side. You'll see some of it coming down, but it's not as dominant in this co-dominant where things mix. Right. So you have a different level of expression. It's being pushed and moved around. So it, so tiger kind of moves pinstriping Pinstripe around? Pinstriping moves tiger. There's oh, some pinstriping other moves tiger, okay. Tiger moves other things too. Okay. Wow. So it's kind of like if you're thinking about it as like uh, as patterns, right? So you've got horizontal pattern and you've got vertical pattern. Yeah. So tigering contributes to a lot of vertical patterning and breaking things up. And uh, you can see pinstriping really... Uh, 
contributes to horizontal pattern. And so uh, you get things like those real strong quad striping and like Tom was discussing, you get tigering in there, it starts to force that patterning down into that reverse pinning and stuff like that. You can get things like white wall, and tigering will break things up like that. It breaks up patterning really well too. So it just depends on the dominance of that of that particular trait and that particular gene, how they mix in complete dominantly with each other. Gotcha. Yeah. And then then with brindle, yeah, like people they separate tiger and brindle. Same thing. It's still tiger. Mm -hmm. So brindling is you have the pinstripe, it, or you know it could be different different types with uh, phantom and things like that. Okay. So it it ends up breaking it into spots, right? Yeah. So the tiger pushes that pattern into certain areas. So when you see the above the mid lateral line, mm -hmm. you start seeing these areas and it's split apart, gotcha. right? Gotcha, yeah. So that's the tiger forcing the pigment to migrate into those areas, it's breaking it apart. Interesting. Still tiger, you call yeah. it brindle. Right. Down below the lateral line, what happens a lot more common, and on some animals that are more advanced, you'll see more breaking up of the tigering. So it's like, pixelation or freckling we call mm -hmm. it right yeah so so you okay. end up with all this messed up pattern down below and all this broken apart right and it's it's tiger it's just tiger it's just tiger yep yeah. tigering yeah it's like it's like the bare bottom normal part of the animal it's something that's ingrained in them uh, kind of like the br morph inside of uh uh, gargoyle geckos right so you have you have different types of reticulation and patterning there mm -hmm. and it forms slightly different depending on the on how the animal develops but tigering is something that's just inherent in crested geckos it doesn't seem like it's something that you can just pull out it will always be contributing to pattern in some way or another and that's something tom and i have been talking about for a really long time so we'll go back and forth we'll compare a bunch of animals and be like this is to tigering this is to tigering yeah. what we normally call a tigering okay. it's just something that's always there so you can relate it to ball pythons they have all those alien heads right yeah depending on what the morph is it will change those alien heads quite a bit dramatically in some so yeah, it just really depends on, on, on how the interaction of all these traits in, are, are in these animals. Well, I've got a question for you guys because I've been telling uh, my guys to really try to get the super tiger to happen. And is that going to be possible? Can we stack tiger on tiger? <laughs> get, get rid of your pinstripe. Okay, get pinstripe Stay out away of from completely. pinstripe. Animals that were made from pinstripes, because when you get into phenotypes and you yeah. go back generations, you might not visually see it in that animal but a percentage if you go through Punnett squares, yeah. some of them, depending on how close they are, are gonna start popping up in your phenotypes, gotcha. at which you don't wanna pick up. So yeah. look for animals look, anything or anything that you know, if you've raised things for years or generations, mm -hmm. you know your lines, yep. get away from that. All right, yeah. good advice. I learned something. Tigering is that vertical patterning. You get rid of horizontal patterning in the animal, it starts to change to those super, you'll see, they'll start seeing that trait be more dominant, contributing to the pat, top coat pattern. Yeah. Well, it seems so simple now. <laughs> yeah. 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 So <laughs> it really goes back to wild type. Like Anthony compiled a bunch of the, uh, some original pictures and mm -hmm. stuff, you know, wild type stuff, yeah. right? And we looked at it and I'm like, you can't, you can barely see some things in there, right. but it's like, that's tiger. Like we could start picking out where we yeah. started. Right. So go back to the beginning of this hobby. When we started breeding yeah. stuff, the first things that we started to notice to come out, right? We started mm -hmm. to get flame. Yep. We started to get pinstriping. Tigering was all over the place, mm -hmm. right? You could see what was heavy and you have thousands of years of, you know, hey, this helps the animal survive or right. this doesn't yeah. hinder the animal from surviving. Exactly. So it's, stacked for thousands of years to whatever degree in the wild population. Yeah. So this is when people try to make really cool new things, mm -hmm. right? Without some random mutation, we have to use this and yeah. how they control each have. other. So always, whenever you're assessing an animal, go back to bare bones basics. Like Harlequin, it's, it's flame right. is what it's it is. So when you list your animal and you're looking through, it might be stacked to different levels. Mm -hmm. It might be reacting a certain way because of what else is in your animal. But once you go through and you go, okay, flame, pinstripe, and you can almost 
do like a one to ten scale on them okay. and see what might be more dominant. So when yeah. you use that animal to breed, you can start gauging the phenotypes and the levels of phenotypes. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually seeing, like if you keep all your animals back for a couple of generations, you will notice that a particular pair will produce anywhere between four to eight phenotypes. Um, the Punet square for that might be much larger because that would be if you were to separate each and every single trait out, uh, depending on whether the animal's heterozygous for a trait or it's homozygous for a trait, right? If it's homozygous for a trait, it's always going to be there. If it's heterozygous for a trait, then it's only going to be there half of the time. And heterozygous and homozygous doesn't mean it's recessive. It just means it only has one copy of the allele or two copies of the allele. So that's one big misconception in our industry um, that you see all the time is people will associate the word heterozygous to mean recessive when it's, that's not exact. That's not what it means at all. Recessive is, is its type of dominance, meaning that it needs a homozygous form of that trait in order to present visually. Yep. So the biggest, biggest things that you see people talking about. I see absolutely. Facebook groups of people saying that, you know, that trait is non-visual. It does not carry a head. And I've seen that phrase used very, very often. It gets repeated all the time. But if you use any of those terms and you go to Google just to look them up, it's so confusing in our industry. You'll notice that people don't even know what, what it means afterward after they look at like genetic terms and the definition because they don't relate to what the conversation is. It doesn't make any sense. So. Exactly. Yeah. And they're, they're hard to see sometimes. Like you see something and you don't know, you know, it's different levels of expression, yeah. but it until you start studying like we have and we've yeah. raised all these animals you start to go like even with some of my stuff he's like wait a minute look at this this one's <laughs> why are they so yellow yeah. when we're talking about like i was doing this orange cold fusion right mm -hmm. and some of them are very clean and very yellow which means less or no melanin so that makes sense we're like hypo yeah right, right. so so now when i <laughs> when I bred her out, I literally bred her to one of your animals, mm -hmm. which carried the Betty, is a son of Betty White. Gotcha. Right? Yep. And I got animals that look just like her. Mm -hmm. I got orange nice. all over the plate, or that yellowish yeah. orange, right? Yeah. Amazing. And it's like, okay, so she may be carrying that homozygous form. Okay. Right? How do you guys work that, that yep. incomplete that dominance? Works? When you're when you're trying to figure it out, how do you work incomplete dominance into that Punnett square type formula? Because it's, you know, so, you don't you don't care. So for the most part, if if you're trying to just relate incomplete dominance, it's yeah. not necessarily a Punnett square. It's so not a Punnett square thing. Good. I didn't think so. I was just wondering because I I didn't know how to do that formula if it was. Yeah, yeah. So 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 when you look at Punnett squares, you're doing genotyping, right? So that means that it's all text and you're looking at what the probability of odds are, right? Anything that's related to incomplete dominance, co-dominance uh, is what you observe with your eyes. So it's a phenotype, right? Yeah. And you can't do that on a Punnett square. You can predict the odds, whether it's heterozygous or homozygous, right? but you have to observe the, the animal to see if it has a super form or if it's dominant or if it's recessive. Okay. So uh, to some degree, you, you just have to use your eyes and then you have to be intelligent enough to be to relate that to a Punnett square afterwards. So it's something you have to produce first, look at all the phenotypes, document what you see, and then you're able to predict whether you're going to get, say, a super form like in ball pythons or some, some leopard geckos, right? So people have already done that in our community and looked at it to see what the difference is and what the odds are. Yep, yep. Yep. And, and something I, we talked about this the other night, real simple. With incomplete dominant, you have different levels of expression. Okay. So every trait, different levels of expression, if you want to number them, whatever. So I looked at it like playing a three-digit lottery number. Mm -hmm. If you have three incomplete dominant traits that can all blend, because yeah. that's incomplete, and you show every level of each one of yeah. dominance yep. because of how they're stacked gotcha. or dominance over each other straight, and you end up with a thousand possible combinations mm -hmm. or looks. Now they'll all have all those traits, but to different degrees. So everybody's like, we can't figure this out. This yeah. is like, you know, in the industry, that's what it is. It's like, oh, you know, it's a box of chocolates. You just don't know what you're <laughs> going to get. But yeah. that's a really confusing part and it, yeah. it throws people and it's hard to 
get back on track to the basic wild types and you know start breaking it down definitely and i think this is going to help out a lot i think right here i can send a, a punnet square of exactly what tom was talking about we can do a pinstripe dalmatian and like a phantom right so a phantom pinstripe dalmatian we've seen those we all know what they look like and so if you have a male and a female say the female's het for phantom i can send a punnet square that has that entire chart and you'll see all the phenotypes that are produced wow all right well that's cool yeah. So before we go any further, um, guys, maybe we should clear up a little bit more about um, genotype, phenotype, just so everybody is, has a full understanding. Um, we covered uh, the codom, um, incomplete dom thing. Um, let's just cover that and make sure everybody is on the same page that's watching today. Okay, so phenotype is visual. We can see it. It can still be carried and not be visual which is a genotype. Okay. So genotype and phenotype can be the same thing, but if it's not visible, we refer to it as the uh, genotype. Okay. So it's, it's carried, it's a carried gene or trait. Yeah, all right. Yep. Gen genotype is genes and phenotype is what it looks like. The, the visual expression Got it. basically. Yep. All right. You need a phenotype in order to see it. So you have to see it. So all anything, also anything related to incomplete dominance and co-dominance is a phenotype. We have to see it to know whether it's incomplete dominant or not. Gotcha. Looking at text on a piece of paper or the genotype information isn't gonna give us that. Gotcha, all right. Um, something uh, I talked to Tom a little bit about and Anthony a little bit about was uh, these uh, phantoms. What's going on with those? Yeah, so we, we already sort of covered the Tiger yep. is actually the reverse pin or the phantom pin. Yep. But phantom is not a pin. It's so, a, yep. yeah, I'll let Anthony explain. He worked <laughs> a lot more with fan, what we're going to call phantoms from now yeah, on. Yeah, that's crazy because the they've always been pin. called pins. So like but phantom he's done pins. a lot more work. All I've right. got a great understanding Man, of them now. You're going to make a lot of people angry, but let's yep. go. Have at it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> So yeah, we've been referring to phantom pin as phantom pinstripe as one thing or carried with phantom. Uh, you hear that all the time, but the thing is, is that pinstriping is on its own allele. It's a different trait than phantom is. Phantom actually is recessive, meaning you can produce phantom from two animals that have no visual phantom. So it's recessive, meaning that they each are the heterozygous form. So they're het for phantom. That one everybody knows. Um, so we've seen that time and time again in the community. You see it all the time. People post about it like, oh, look it, I produced this phantom out of these two normal looking animals or two really nice harlequins even sometimes. So the interesting thing is that, like Tom said, we've been stacking pinstripe for how many generations, right? All these animals have come out of almost a single one to two to three very, very large collections in the community. And so pinstripe is one of those first early ons that everybody sought after uh, back in the early 2000s. I mean, people wanted to pay up to five to $10,000 for those animals when we first started seeing them in the magazines. I crazy, mean, right? Remember, right? Especially those crazy blue ones. I don't know if you've seen the Bavaria magazine with those. <laughs> I did see that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Now I've got some old pictures too. I actually still have those images because I bought that magazine. I took a picture of it. I've nice. got it too. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Um, I guess so moving on a little bit, uh, the, how, how do well, colors work? Well, or do you want to keep going with that? Uh, 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 talk about the cover of the phantom and what it, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So anything like on the top coat pattern gets reduced. So phantom increases melanin quite a bit, and it adds it to the animal. And there's a few areas where it loses its dominance. So Tom and I have been talking about how to explain certain traits and and how they look like uh, they tend to lose dominance. So we, we usually will refer to it like in certain parts of the area, the animal like behaves like a co-dominant trait where it loses its dominance. And you can see something like that in like uh, pied ball pythons, for example, the pure white area. It's almost not incomplete dominant because you don't see any other color. It's just pure white. Yeah. So it kind of behaves co-dominantly. But in the patterned areas, you can see that it's definitely an incomplete dominant morph. So, so phantom functions in the same way. You'll see like by the base of the tail, the animal loses its dominance for that for, for phantom. So some of the pinstriping will come through and it goes almost all the way up to the center of the dorsal in some animals. Even on the laterals and the sides where the pure white is, 
uh, it, there's not a whole lot of melanin there. So because of another trait that's there physically controlling it. So adding melanin to something that's pulling it out, you'll see it almost acts co-dominantly because it doesn't have that color there. Yeah, and we're, and we're yeah, seeing- Phantom we're... is recessive. It's separated from pinstripe. We have plenty of examples of it being separated from pinstripe without pinstripe being present. Yeah, yep. and then when you get pinstriping involved, right, we see these animals that show this big, bold, mid-lateral line. Yeah. And, and a lot of them, they start out with reds. We stacked reds for years in this industry to where we were losing crests. Yeah, so it's yeah. really dominant. Yeah. It's stacked through the roof. So <clears throat> of anything that can sort of break down phantom, mm -hmm. it's reds, pinstripes, the strongest things that the I've hobby bred for a into them. Okay. So that's why you're getting these animals that are like, oh, wow, cool, that's a red phantom. Like, well, we're recognizing it as that, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. not everybody realizes that that's a phantom, <laughs> and it's yep, and it's yep. and it's forcing the pattern, the the pinstripe. Yeah. It's forcing the pattern to migrate in that <laughs> mid lateral line, just like it's doing in wow. the back of the pin. It's starting to creep up. You guys are very so, observant because so <laughs> and look at your lily whites. It's the same thing. You get these lily whites. You're like, oh, it's a phantom red lily white. How come they're always red? Or most of them are red. Interesting. Because of that dominance. Yeah. That level right. of dominance in an incomplete dominance. So the hobby's kind of created more dominant traits <clears throat> by stacking. We've confused ourselves because we've stacked yes. this, we've stacked the pretty things. I mean, oh, honestly. Yeah. Well, that, that's what we're, that's what I have a natural is. tendency to do probably. Right, right? so it's yeah. a human thing. We've done that and now we're like, we we have to get back to the basics, which is what we're doing. Yeah, understanding the what wild we're working with, yeah. And if anything I can impose or impress on anybody, it's Go back to the initial wild type things that we first saw come out. Look at how the hobby has continued to stack these things mm -hmm. for dominance. That's yeah. really what we're seeing. We're seeing a culmination of, of our practices right now. Absolutely. And I know you guys talked to uh, Philippe and Alan Rapashi and the, the guys that were around right at the beginning who had those wild type animals. Um, do they... Did they provide you guys with pictures, and are we going to be able to see those so we have a better understanding? I mean, I've seen some of the old magazines and books, but... Yeah, I got a couple pictures from Philippe. I'm trying to get a couple more. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, I'm trying to compile a huge list of wild-type genetics so that we can actually look at them, compare them to what we're producing now. Uh, and you'll, you'll notice that like a lot of those traits that are in those animals are still in our animals now. And that's just how it works, right? This is how genetic works. So, and, and like everybody's going to look at this video and they're going to be like, well, what about polymorphism, right? Let's bring that big topic up. What about polymorphism? So polymorphism, obviously we understand it in the community as a slot machine of traits that all animals have and you pull a lever and that's what comes out. So that, that's why crested geckos are so hard to breed, right? That's what most people have thought of for polymorphism. Um, I mean, even I was guilty of it back in the day before I learned what I it actually was. Yeah. And Tom, do you want to talk about how it's how uh, fixed dominance and uh, fixed polymorphism? Well, the whole issue we have in this industry with uh, polymorphism is we don't understand right? I think that's more of the case. I'm, I'm trying to tailor this towards the hobbyists in the community. Yeah. I don't know how deep we want to get into the genetic aspect. I mean, let's go there. Let's, <clears throat> let's get into it a little bit, at least. A little bit. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. If, if you look at it, it continually proves through our own breeding practices that this is not, not all of it is polymorphic, right? So yeah, yeah. you start to get more consistent. Like a lot of breeders, they start breeding something for, it's just visual, right? Sure. We're just humans, we're looking at it visually. Yep. There's things that are structurally happening to make it visual. Right, so, so you'll, you'll, you'll breed two animals and you'll see what they produce and you'll see a pattern form eventually. And that pattern is the phenotype expression that gets produced. Right. So a certain animal like a Panette square can only produce a certain amount of phenotypes. Right. And so when you have 
fixed dominance, which you see in ball pythons and you see in leopard geckos. You can go out to the wild and a lot of them look the same. So you get this normal type, right? And the problem is, is with crested geckos within the same ecosystem, and you can also read this in the Rachidactylus book, within feet of each other, will have a totally different expression and what they look like. And this one might be almost all black or patternless. Uh, this one will have some patterning and is a little bit darker. So it's probably a phantom harlequin. Um, and the thing is, is you have all these traits that are being bred in the wild amongst each other that all work to disguise the animal. So it works, right? So what happens, what that means is that's called fixed polymorphism. It means all these wild type traits of different looking animals work for survivability. So it becomes, instead of fixed dominant trait, it becomes a fixed polymorphic trait. So it's fixed polymorphism. And so you have all these traits that are floating around that work for survivability. Some of them are recessive. Some of them are dominant or incomplete dominant. Um, and so that's one of the things there, right? So, so where, where do we go with that? How do we, how do we figure out what each individual trait is? And that's something Tom and I have been working on for a really long time. Like how exactly do we bring it to the community to figure that out? And the best way is looking at all the phenotypes that you produce and then breathing those phenotypes out to see what individual traits are. So that's what Tom and I have been doing for I don't know, 10 plus years. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, so when we start stacking those, once we really get a grasp on what they are mm -hmm. and we start stacking them, you start noticing in your collection when you breed to that standard. Yeah. Okay. You start going, oh, wow, I'm getting a lot more of this phenotype because you're intentionally breeding for it. Yeah. Your percentages of your phenotype, you know, it yes. increases and you get for some sure. variation yeah. in different levels of it. Yep. But I can literally take a pair and go, I know I'm getting three or four phenotypes out of it. I'm getting 20% this. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting this phenotype. You know, okay. It's a different percentage. I can yeah. almost predict what I'm going to have yeah. next yeah. season based on this season. So it's, it's That's great. So and, then and you start to know how strong each one of those are in that, yeah. those animals. And that's where the calculator, your kind of crested gecko calculator comes in. Right. So it's non-Mendelian. Is that the right, right. term? Right. Non-Mendelian. Mon, non Mendelian yeah. so genetics. People worry about Mendelian genetics, yeah. and there are That's certain easy. rules. Like yeah. there's rules. There's rules. But it's not genetics, it's not the whole picture. So yeah. if your it's brain the, gets yeah. stuck on that, if you go down that rabbit hole and that's all you're looking at, mm -hmm. you're missing a bigger picture. Yeah. And crested geckos have, they do have some of those, like, you know, straight dominant and straight recessive traits, right? Right. Yeah. But there's so much more to it than that. Is what we're yeah. saying. Yeah, the and biggest portion in most reptiles is incomplete dominance. Mm -hmm. So when you try to breed something that's incomplete dominant, or try to make them work together to produce that phenotype you really yeah. want, or take a mutation and continue an incomplete dominant mutation, like I said before, you can lose it, mm -hmm. or you can breed for it and intentionally pick out the animals that express it more start stacking it, making it more dominant, yeah. and therefore increase your percentage of that phenotype as you move forward. But it's, it takes generations and years. Right. So, so that's selective breeding, essentially. It's, yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, but, but now we have a basis for it. Yeah, no. Versus, to have some oh, that looks pretty. Let's put a pretty gecko with a pretty gecko. It's, yeah. <laughs> so we're beyond that now. We should Guilty. be much more. Be, hey, yeah. That is, that's the industry, <laughs> right? We all started that way until yeah. the last. We all started that way, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And then there, there came a point where, personally, I started taking reds yeah. back in, what was it, 2006 when I started this, right? I, mm -hmm. I actually got my first red from you. Yep. And... Uh, I took that animal and I bred it to a bunch of females and then I started taking those and they had different looks so I started different lines. So yeah. like, I'm seven generations in and now I, these things are hypo looking because they're sort of pinkish red. Mm -hmm. um, Which one is this? That This is the moonshine red. The moonshine red. You I, sent I me pictures into. of those. They're amazing. I called some of them lead red. They're very cool. It has to do with moonshine burning red when you first start gotcha. you know, pouring it out of the still because it's <laughs> basically it'll kill you yep. um so i call them lead red some of them um but it's it's very hypo and what's great is when you break a trait down to that level yep 
when I put something else with it, I learn what that other animal's doing, what traits come out of it, because I know this is constant. A lot of reds, if you breed them to black-based black, black based animals or mm -hmm. darker-based animals, you get the old brick reds, right? Right. It was a big problem. Nobody could get the bright reds. But when you have a bright red mm -hmm. and you have a hypo red and you breed things into it, I can understand what's in the other animal because this is so consistent. This gotcha. hypo red, and I've yeah. done it for so long and so many generations and outcrossed back and made it so solid that when I breed them to reds, mm -hmm. I get about 80% clean red animals. There's a little bit of the melanin nice. from the other animal, but yeah. it's weak. So they look more like a, a standard nice red, not that pink. Yeah. But literally, I took your triple X line, yep. and I call it candy, and most of them came out like red tricolors. Oh, They're man. beautiful. Nice. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so this reverse engineering, yeah. pulling this trait, yeah. and try to get it to stand alone or as, at least as much as possible. Now, now reds, you know, we talked about phantom. Mm -hmm. A lot of reds, bicolors. Remember back in the day when they were trying yeah. to breed? Yep. A lot of those are phantoms. Okay. And you get the port holing. You get the port holing. Yep. You can get it from a couple of things. And uh, we see it in flame or harlequin where yep. you see the little dots on that mm -hmm. lateral line again, right? Yeah. The we're talking about pinstriping yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. So you start to see them there. Hmm. But the red comes through a lot more on a phantom. It looks red. Okay. Because that... It's more. It's becoming more dominant. Gotcha. It's stacked more if you breed them right. Right. So yeah. think about how you build your animals to create these monsters later that look really cool and have what you want in them. Yeah. Yeah. Just having this little bit of understanding that we ha that you guys have kind of figured out is like going to be huge and just getting to where you need to get to a lot yeah. faster than. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really useful because like you know a lot of smaller breeders out there that start looking at things they can understand that they can progress to an end result. It's not a slot machine that like, oh, you just have to go get that animal from that person, you know, and wait for it. But you can actually progress through years as Tom has proven, as I've shown, and as you've shown. You can definitely progress traits through time. Absolutely. I think we can do this a lot faster now with yeah. this understanding. That's, that's like, exactly. I, I build these little monsters a little shout out to, to I know, like I have a vision in my head and yeah. I know what I want this phenotype to look like. Mm -hmm. So I build animals to breed together. Gotcha. So yeah. you build them at the right strengths and when they hit, they hit. And it, you kind of know what you're going to get more, more than we ever yeah. did before. Anyway. And that so. one in 10 animal, yep. it's beautiful. It's like, I actually hit what I was trying for. And That's great. likewise, sometimes you'll hit something and be like, happy accident yeah right like oh and then you look back at all your phenotypes yep and you're like oh yeah that was in the mix it makes and sense. I, it didn't okay. even cross my mind gotcha. so nice happy accidents are a great thing for sure i did a punette square for um one of the tangerines i produced recently and um it was a one in 128 chance of getting that particular animal yeah. crazy and they do hit and yeah to advance beyond where you are when you hit one of those and you start working that animal that's yeah. when we're really gonna start making these leaps forward definitely and, definitely you know i've talked to other people in the industry and that 20 year mark when you're breeding whatever species it is mm -hmm. and uh when you hit that 20 year mark things start to happen yeah that's kind of Pretty typical when we start to understand 2014 it. 2014 would have been around the 20 year mark. Yeah, but see. Of being in captivity. But right? see, we didn't know the traits. Oh, sure. Oh, I got you. Right? <laughs> yeah. But we didn't understand enough. So we. 20 years from now. We've slowed it down. 20 years? <laughs> What's that? We had Alan breeding them all within that main huge collection for how many years? So it's like around. It's true, until 2000. Or 96 until 2000? Right. Yeah, that's about right. <clears throat> yep. But we yeah. didn't have that understanding yet. No, yeah. definitely not. So, so no. we pushed that timetable back. I but, see what you're saying. Yep. Yeah. But if so. we knew them all and we knew how, to, then you start seeing all these yeah. things come out. But awesome. We're with this. We should get there faster. Very cool. And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about morphs. Triple um, X. Um, Tom has explained to me what I created, so I'll let him do it again. <laughs> so <laughs> by accident. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been working with. Him. Kind of since the inception, I picked up one animal and then a couple shortly thereafter. 
Um, what it is basically is a tiger without pinstriping because pinstriping breaks it. Anytime you breed a triple X to a pinstripe, yeah. it breaks up. It looks like a harlequin, mm -hmm. right? So you were originally all orange animals. It was kind of a Halloween thing, but the white pattern comes in with red and black base animals. You will get white and orange, all white, all orange. Okay. So it, it sort of divides. So the tiger is what made the bands <clears throat> kind of cross the um, dorsal. Right, the, the lack of pinning yep. allowed it to saddle over the dorsal. Gotcha. So somehow you effectively made that happen. You got rid of a very dominant, built to be tom dominant, co-dominant trait in the industry to not be there or somehow you got rid of it or yeah well I, when you know. I, I mean that one when i produced the first uh triple x's those animals that triple x thing was very dominant um so when i bred it with you know another just a kind of a normal harlequin without pinstriping um yeah. you would get the triple x and it, it just yeah you get a was, better a better visual a phenotype of it sometimes there's a little pinning and it'll still kind of saddle in between mm -hmm. Or even when you do have pinstriping, when it's present, there are the markings on the on the dorsal, and you can almost see the pinstriping markings yeah. that line up <laughs> on a yeah. good percentage of the sidelines, right? Yeah. So it's there. Yep. It's just getting you know dominated by the pinstripe. Right on. So that was pretty cool. The the Halloween aspect of it mm -hmm. was great because it was it was a big deal. Yeah. Now you've got ones that are red 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 oh yeah yeah which so are amazing so <laughs> so incomplete dominant being hard to maintain yeah right so you've noticed probably with your triple x that you breed them out to different things mm -hmm. and then there's all these different phenotypes i got the same exact thing because i was doing the same thing yep right but with the reds i stuck with it <clears throat> and i've got all these different generations and uh directions that i went with reds yep so i started outcrossing in all these different directions and then taking the ones that showed that saddling the best right. and started to bring them together. And after it's been four or five generations at least, mm -hmm. like this year I produced a female that is a red triple X. All the pattern is orange because I kept it. All the base is nice. red. Yeah. It's over the back. It's ridiculous. Awesome. Right? Awesome. And, and before that, there were a lot of them that were a little bit broken. And I'm still using those animals because... I used that red that I made, that mm -hmm. moonshine red. Yeah. That helped me look at this trait. That, because when when we first started this, this was a sort of a gentleman's agreement. Yep. <laughs> and I don't want you know we got to keep the market good. You know we exactly. don't want to mass produce because I can mass produce these things if I want to. Mm -hmm. We don't want to kill the market. We don't want to you know. Yep. There, there's no reason for us to be at odds, right? Exactly. So it's yep. sort of a community yep. goodwill thing. Absolutely. So instead of trying to make black and orange triple X's, I wanted to keep the orange intact. Yep. Right? Because it's kind of part of the heart and soul of it. Yeah. But I went straight for red because yeah. I had these reds that I developed, and I'm like, this is the most logical direction. It is because two years, two year timeline, you knew I was going to have a lot of what I was producing yeah. and. And to within, go a different direction and know you yeah. could get there was the smart way to go. So. Yeah, and within two years, yeah. I came out to your facility, your old facility, yep. and gave you one. Right. The, yep. Because the reds were hard to make, mm -hmm. right? Because things weren't understood at that time. But I was able to do it in two generations. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that sort of this community feeling, I, I love the community. There's a lot of garbage out there, but... I tried to keep things straight, and yeah. you trusted me with your line. Yep. I gave back what I was able it's to the way do with it. Should it. Be, right? So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how it should be. You know, breeders working with breeders, nice. you know, good communication back and forth. I mean, Tom and I traded animals after a while too, because I was looking on your site because he kept telling me about Triple X and telling me that it's a separate gene. Uh, from like Harlequin and stuff like that. And we were talking about it back and forth. We're like, well, maybe it's a Lelic with like some type of tar tigering. You know, and that's where we started that conversation back and forth. So Tom started telling me about it. And after that, I got interested. And I was like, damn, 
I gotta go look at buying one. So I went to Pangea. <laughs> yeah, so I sent him some. What about this one? Yeah, some triple X red. Yeah, it was funny. You know, you get into these sort of. Well, I'll send you some stuff. You send, and then yep. we get into it, and it's like, he was like, oh, I don't know, because he only thought I was offering him a couple animals, mm -hmm. but I was offering him like pretty much everything I showed him. Yep. He was like, Are you serious? Are you going to send me all that? But it's like, Yeah, yeah. of course I am. Right. You want to play with this? And then he yeah. ended up sending me. Uh, Super soft scale, uh, hyper tangerine male, and it was like, because I'm going to work that into my cold fusion line, mm -hmm. which is this sort of bluish base. Yeah, the cold fusions are amazing, and we'll show some pictures of those uh, when we cut those in later, but they're, unless, did you bring some with you? Um, I did, okay. but it depends on how they fire, how I they know. show up, but we I took, some, actually, we, we took some pictures here earlier. Oh, great. And one of them was looking real nice, and Perfect. it's something that may be available yeah. in the near future. Yeah, those things are crazy so. looking. And yeah, kudos, good work on those. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> um, uh, Anthony, what are you working on? What kind of what kind of stuff are, are you playing with? Um, I do a lot of Phantom stuff. I, I love Phantom, it's one of my favorite traits. Um, it really richens the color of the animal because it adds that melanin in. Mm -hmm. So if you can get really, really bright citrus animals, um, you'll see they fade out to like almost like a white but then they fire up within three different stages. Like the color transformation of a phantom for me is probably one of the best things. Like you can have an eye, two different animals all in the same animal. That's one of my favorite things about them. So I, I do a lot of phantom stuff. Um, we have a really nice lavender line and uh, we've gotten a lot of animals uh, originally back in 07, 08 from Canada. Um, Doug Healy and uh, Betty Misik. So gecko brothel, yep. uh, really old time animals. So like real old lines, but uh, you know they came back. They they went into Canada and kind of like developed their own little ecosystem of, of crested geckos and yeah. and like the breeding there. So I really really wanted those lines because they were nice and I love the stuff that they did from back then. How are you finding a uh, soft scale to play in the whole equation of uh, you know everything? <laughs> <laughs> I love the soft scales. Yeah. They're awesome. Yeah, so it kind of makes them look cleaner, do you think? Or what is the, what is the ultimate, like... It's bright. It's bright, right? Yeah. It's like... It's like, yeah. the way the light refracts yep. through the structures, because it's different, yeah. potentially. Like, yeah. we're, we're looking at all kinds of aspects of it, like, you know, microstructure and shapes and... and it's kind of like moths, right? One of the things that you, you mentioned, Tom, was it's like how moth scales work. Like, if they get wet and stuff like that, they reflect, reflect, reflect. Refract refract, refract light differently because it modifies the structure of the chromatophore. Yeah, and the light passes through it differently, right? So when you get them wet, they look like nothing. And when they're dry, you get this refraction of light through them and it's just all yeah. these, you know, great colors. Yeah, so very cool. And so what is it? It's just equally sized scales, small scales, or is it, do we know? So, so I have some macro shots of them that I showed initially. Um, AC Reptiles was showing some some shots, and I and at the same time I was actually doing um, a very similar thing to try to showcase it, and so I got a thousand time loop basically or a microscope, uh, and and took some shots of different animals and then normals, regular soft scales and super soft scales, and you can see the scales are differently formed, differently shaped. So these are like little tiny micro scales that look like triangles in between larger round scales. And so the gaps between that get larger with the heterozygous form incomplete dominant um, soft scale. Yeah, and they're yeah. very symmetrical. Kind of it's more symmetrical. They're okay. gone, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and and when you have that larger center scale, everything around it, it's very symmetrical. And you can almost, if you look at them up close, there's these lines that just do this through the gecko in nice. between them. It's, it's, really, it's, yeah. it's really cool. There's something else, yeah, for sure. Yep, and uh, you know a lot of people put it down and oh I've had that, mm -hmm. but some people have recognized it, yeah, and worked with it. With you know AC really worked on it a yeah. lot, yep. And I've got them in my collection. I'm using them. It's cool. It's kind of an enhancement to pretty much, yeah. You know, yep. enhancer trait. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And like with we talked about cold fusion, we talk about it as an enhancer trait because it does things to all kinds of different you know, all yeah. the different traits. Yep. So I'm getting a different soft scale appearance. Yep. And I, I call it SAF because when I looked at it, I was like, that's soft as 
something. Expletive. <laughs> and we could probably so, beep things. I don't know. We so, could probably beep things. So it just kind of <laughs> it just kind of stuck. So I just call them SAFs, right? Yep. But here's the thing: now that I bred them through generations, <laughs> and I've also bred them to super soft scales. Yep. Um, now what's happening in this next generation with the cold fusion animals is the scales are dimpling. Hmm. They're literally caving at a point. Wow. And they look like somebody drew them with like pastels. They yeah. look softer. Huh? It's if you if you focus re- softer than soft as, like yeah, it's progressing. Like <laughs> I don't know, like you stack softer than flannel. Yeah, <laughs> but, we talk, flannel, yeah. but we talk but we talk about stacking things, right? So how yep. far is it going to go? This yeah. is just the next generation. It's not like oh, it's a super form or whatever you want to yeah. call it, right? Yeah, or, and then, unless or, it becomes a, a negative thing. form, right? Right. So it's it's progressing. I don't know how far it's going to go if right. it collapses, and you know if we get into scaleless things or something weird in the future. But yeah. but there's all these things starting to happen as we start to use what we know. But this is a happy. I don't know if it's really an accident because I was <laughs> trying to do more with it. Yeah. And I'm breeding it to super soft scale, so I've got this SAF, uh, SSS. You know, we can <laughs> all these acronyms. <laughs> But I'm trying to work these structural features into each other now. Nice. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a cool thing to note too, right? Like there are structural morphs, there are pattern morphs, and there are color morphs. So that's kind of like uh, Tom and I we were, were were outlining the genotypes of these animals as well. So in the future, with the website and and the release of the information for Hot Nation Genetics, we will be releasing something similar to like a Panette Square Calculator, the Interactive Morph Guide, and all that information. So I'm I'm working on the monster part of the work, but for the most part, I want this to be a community-based thing. So like if people want to put it on their website, boom, put it on your website. Become an affiliate, if you will. You know, there's no like paywall or anything. It's just you agree with the information, you've contributed to the information, and we have several readers that are still contributing. So Right, yeah. and I, I think we were talking about some of that information where we could post it places, mm-hmm. like old school, yeah. like the for, like your forum, like one of the, I don't know if it's the only forum standing. That I mean, really, it'd be a good reason to keep it going, guys. I mean, we could put it there, some of it. But, but you know <laughs> what I mean? Like we have places where people can reach, reach it, yep. it can be updated. Yeah. Um, you know, have multiple points of connection to it and sharing because, mm-hmm. you know, I I work with the forum. Um, we can gather information. We can start threads yeah. to share information. So there's all these points of entry to get information. Yeah, it might be a good thing to, to do there and utilize that forum that I still have for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why, why do you still have it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. Here's the thing. The forum any forum, mm-hmm. there's this history there. There is. and I don't want to kill it. I love like, it, but I like to go back like 10 years. Yeah. And I'm like, I remember talking about what was hot, and I'll look <laughs> it up, and it's like, it's there. It's like, yep. ooh, orange creamsicle mm-hmm. is the rage. It's like, yep, okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's it is. this old. It's a time s- capsule kind of, you know. Yeah, but, but we can see where we were, and we can see how we've developed since then. Definitely. You know, how the hobby started stacking stuff, so you can sort of watch the progression. Definitely. So it's a good learning tool. All the basic questions, some of the information is not accurate. It was, it was a good yeah. basis for this industry. Yep. It was amazing from the beginning. But some of that has changed. And so, yeah. so it's, it's being And that's why this is important, what you guys are doing, just to get good information out there and have everybody contribute to it. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's amazing. Yep. And as we move forward, I think we'll start getting into some of that old information versus what we know now. Right. So people stop spreading the old information. Like people fight and argue over old information and you just look at it and you go, nope. <laughs> you know, it's, it's wrong. wrong. <laughs> I, w- I wish the community would not yeah. do that. Once something's accepted, it's hard for the community as a whole to kind of get past it. Right. You know? It's but, like but new an people, accepted norm and then yeah, it's a roadblock. Letting go of the old ways kind of thing. But it, it happens all the time in other communities with other species. Yeah. And we sort of repeat over and over again. Yeah. yeah, people are passionate when they get in their hobbies. I know. And, yeah, but things, no, I think this is cool. You guys are kind of like, we're, we, well, we don't need to be right necessarily. We yeah, just we, want that's, to get it out there. Yeah, that's and, how we work. It's, yeah. it's a full brainstorming. Uh, we beat each other up sometimes <laughs> over things. And, that's good. No, I got a better <laughs> picture. This shows my, I'm right. You know, we go back <laughs> and forth. But, 
Yep. Nobody gets upset, and that's yeah. You know, that's kind of what we want to yep. impose for the community. Very cool. Yep. yep. I like it. Good. So it's productive. Exactly. Now we just need to figure out where people can find this information because we're going to post it on our website, maybe on the on the video too. Yeah. So we'll do that afterwards, and we'll make sure we put links up to you guys and and get that taken care of. Okay. So. Yeah. And on my website as well. So. Okay. Something that interests me is uh, different, the different colors, yellow, orange, red, um, you've got black. How, how do those kind of interplay with each other and how do you predict? Okay, so I created sort of this circular diagram and all of them are incomplete dominant where they can sort of blend and mix with each other, yeah. right? Yep. But on one side, if you take it and you split it down the middle, on one side you have black and red. So what's interesting is those are very connected in some way. Okay. Whereas both of them can produce, like I mentioned before, they can produce uh, orange and white pattern or cream or what you know variations. Mm -hmm. They can do full orange or they can do full white cream, right? Gotcha. So that side of the spectrum does that. Mm -hmm. Also in red tigers, black. yeah. So okay. when we breed orange animals to Red animals, sometimes you see the tiger and come through as red, but they call it strawberry tigers. Yep. So there's some something going on with black and red. Gotcha. So there's a, there's a strong connection that separates from yeah. the oranges and yellows. Okay. Now, oranges and yellows, we're talking about some melanin flowing in, which causes it more, you know, it'll be more orange or a little red. Mm -hmm. So you got black <clears throat> and red, right? So they, when they influence the yellow, you get oranges okay. and Right, so it's less gotcha. clean, but it sh it changes the color. And if you look at the scalation, sometimes on orange animals, on some things, uh, even with the like the soft scales, mm -hmm. like if you really zoom in on it, you see little speckles of red. So it makes <laughs> it look more orange. Okay. Right. So oh, you that's look, interesting. You look a little closer. Yeah. Now, when you get to the clean yellows without the melanin in them, because we had the buckskins. Right. Right. Early stuff, but when it's clean we get what we're looking at as hypo, right? Because that's what we were sort of talking about. Yeah, yeah okay. and, and, and we really... There's a hypo trait in there. Yeah. There's hypos inside of guards, so... Right, and same with the red, right? That way. Yeah. Yep. And we and we see that in some of the other animals, right? Yeah, and we kind of learned working with the cold fusion line. I made the orange variant, but then there were these yellow things, and it's like this <laughs> uh, homozygous... Uh, form of the uh, melanin being gone, right? So it's hypo. So yellow yellow is kind of the hypo thing. If, but it's got to be clean. Clean right? yellow. You, you have to, you'll recognize it when yeah. you see those I've animals. I've seen some of your animals and yeah, definitely. Yeah, so side by side, yep. they're way cleaner, they're way more yellow, and yep. then you have the oranges. Okay. So we have this incomplete dominance, like people separate base traits and like, or base colors and, and mm -hmm. the other traits, mm -hmm. but you know, they're all kind of acting in similar ways and interacting with each other. Because they are all incomplete, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. So it everything is like there is a hypo trait like you're like you're talking about that seems to be pulling melanin out. So it really brightens those yellows and stuff and the reds. So and it's don't... like the black animals too, right? You take an animal like almost like a melanistic. Right. So we yep. have these animals that are really dark, but they show the brown. Mm hmm That melanin can be brown. Yep. So don't Defined discard it. brown or black pigment, right? Right. So, okay. So that yeah. head and the, the dorsal black or brown, which yeah. you see even in exanthic sometimes, Yep. right? It's still melanin. So, Absolutely, yeah. So we're looking, you know, you can call it an exanthic. It'll have that. Right. It, it's just part of the wild type genetics that are so strong that it's okay. overcoming, you know, this recessive gene. What do you what what is happening like on some of my red Dalmatian animals? The Dalmatian spots are almost um, faded. Red or white? Oh, they're they're, they're oil like oil cans, right? They call oil them oil canning. oil spotting. I don't. Yeah, there's different yeah, terms so, for it. But what is that? So this is the chromatophore talk, right? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's what we're talking about. So and, and we talk about <laughs> complexes with Dalmatian spots, maybe yeah. being a complex. Okay. Maybe even tigers could have a complex of a couple of different things. All right. So we don't really know. We That's keep looking be, at it, to right? Be determined. So, All right. Yeah, yeah, we need information. Okay. But yeah, I mean, literally, you have layers of skin, right? Right. So there's all the layer dermal layers, and different things are in different layers, mm -hmm. and some things peek through, 
it could be like structurally it lets it through sure. in little spots. So okay. it, it, genetically it's structurally, but we look at it as visually. Yep. So, so you there's know, different lev and, levels of the skin layers and chromatophores are in how many of those? Like, do we know or is it, is, we don't know. That I, I don't know if anybody's actually studied yeah. it, but. But so light hits any it. Idea? If it's deep, it comes. We probably don't know that yet, do we? What was the question? Uh, like how many layers of skin there are and how many layers have chromatophores? All of them, none of, or Lu like, Luciophores, well, obviously some of them do, but yeah. Melanophores, yeah. yeah. There's technically three of them. Okay, three layers. So there's technically three layers and okay. each layer can produce a variation of one side or the other. Okay. So you've got iridophores, uh, within the chromatophore, you've got the uh, xanthophores, and depending on the color that gets produced, that's the name within that layer. Okay. So it, it's very complicated. And if you like try to look at this information online, yeah. so um, we're, I am outlining that in the guide as well. So you will see, a, I'm, I'm making the diagrams myself as well. So I'm like looking at diagrams that they have online and books and, and I'm, I'm remaking them or making them so that they, they're more understood. And you can see how melanin travels between these layers so that your animal, when it fires up, that's what's actually happening. It's melanin traveling between these layers uh, within the chromatophore that creates the chromatophore. Yeah, okay. so your oil can spots, like a regular Dalmatian spot, it's, here it is, yeah, right? It's, yeah. it's there. This is kind of coming through yep. in little bits and pieces all in the same area, mm -hmm. but you're getting some areas that are covered. Yeah, and right? they can fight, so, and the spots change a little bit when they fire up too. Yeah, so, yeah I mean, might you talk about stuff. crested geckos and firing. Yeah. But we're looking <laughs> so, at stuff that it's like multiple living. base colors in an yeah. animal when it fires, because you look at them, it's like it fires five different ways. Right. Different levels, oh, yeah. different bases that come out. For sure. Um, one great example, the strawberry tiger. So you breed a orange to a red, and sometimes mm -hmm. you get tigering that looks red. Yeah. And when it fires up, the animal's almost like a reddish orange. And then when it fires another way, it looks sort of a orangey yellow, and you see all those red tiger stripes, mm -hmm. right? So you have these layers, and people yeah. go, I want to see a crested gecko fired. Show me it fired. Right. Well, you know what? Here's the reality. <laughs> We're around during the day. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so what do your animals look like during the day? They're the most small, usually. How come we're not looking at stuff during the day when it's fired down and try to develop some of that? Because that it makes gives sense, you yeah. that also gives you clues as to traits, mm -hmm. right? So I'm going to go back to cold fusion. When those fire down, all the way down, if they're really strong with that trait and mm -hmm. it's not interfered with too much, they look sky blue. They glow. They have a glow to them. When you open it, like the first time I ever opened it, mm -hmm. the original cold fusion hatched out golden brown. It mm -hmm. developed. One day, a friend came over, and I went, oh, yeah, check this out. And I opened it, and it was glowing. He was like, what the hell just happened here? <laughs> like, yep. here's a clue, right? Right. So that's, you know, something right. we need to look at. You don't just look at them when they're fired up. Right. Don't just buy them for when they're fired up. Mm -hmm. If you're around them during the day and that's what you enjoy. I could have sold a bunch of moon glows if I went by that logic, though. Yeah. <laughs> the oh, daytime trust me. <laughs> Moon glows. <laughs> trust me. Well, oh, are we all showing our age here? Yeah, it, a little bit. A well, little bit. <laughs> it's actually a thing, but it's not what everybody thinks it is, right? Yeah. It's a slightly yellowish or gray, yeah. lower expression animal. And, mm -hmm. you know, that was a Robbie Hamper deal. And if you, if you <laughs> I talked to her about it. She's look, like, I, I so regret dude, ever saying that. If, yeah. But, if, yeah. <laughs> but it's the truth. If you go to the show, she has a bunch of light animals because mm -hmm. that's what she developed. Right. She worked on something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So now it's like the unicorn and, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. But, <laughs> you know, yep. it's it's a thing. It is. Uh, kind if of. you want to try to sell something that's real light for a ton of money and yeah. put that name on it, I've seen it done. You know, yep. it gets ugly sometimes. For sure. Yeah. No. We'll stay away from that one. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, what else is going on with uh, these the different morphs that you guys have played with? Um, I I hate the term morphs. Okay. I mean, it's We're a not calling them morphs anymore. Right. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I mean. What are we going to call? Oh, I have a broad term. I know, but like. Yeah. yeah. That's the one thing. It's a combination wrong. of traits mostly. Is Do I have to say this is my combination of traits animal? Yeah. I mean, well, you can list the traits. People okay. do that. But you say, this is a Harlequin. Okay, Harlequin. You look at it, there's all these breaks, right? We're talking about horizontal, vertical mm -hmm. lines. 
These are Tiger forcing flame, which we call Harlequin when there's enough of it. Yeah. So it forces it to migrate and separate where the tigering is. Okay. But we we shouldn't have like a general just terminology for like the basic description of the animal. Well, no. we're gonna. Like, I'm sure we're gonna keep some of this stuff like Harlequin. It's just a yeah a greater expression of flame. Okay. Right? It's a stacked yep. flame basically. Mm -hmm. We'll but, just have a better understanding of what we're talking about when we say Harlequin. Yeah, so when you okay. say Harlequin and you show me one and it's like full coverage, mm -hmm. and all you have is, maybe it was a pinstripe, right? And all you have is the little reverse, which yep. is tiger. Sure. Right? So it's a reduced tiger that was being pushed by the pin, and it was so reduced that it allowed that pattern to come up more solid. Yeah. Yeah, right. So it... Yep. So right. all these things work together. So it's funny that you're saying that, Tom, right? Because we in the in, in the Crested Gecko community, we're starving for this kind of information. So we will relate something that is actually an attribute of multiple traits and call it a morph. Right. So like, which is wrong, right? Yeah. We've discovered this over time that reverse heart, reverse pinning isn't a genetic trait. It's an attribute of multiple incomplete dominant things coming together. Right. Yep, and and we call them morphs. We like yeah. label them because it's such a distinct look. Right. And it happens so often because all these wild type traits are yeah. in there and we've stacked them a certain way so we keep getting this repeat, yeah. right? <laughs> so it's oh, it's what we know. We're yeah. humans. This is how we think. Well, plus when I list something on my website, you know, I have to be able to call it something. I can't say this is a tiger, you know, influenced by blah blah blah, you know. Yeah, it's a base a, descriptor. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yep, and people but, we, but maybe morph it. isn't the right term for it. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. Oh, uh, it's phenotype. Just the phenotype is yeah. okay. Phenotype and, expression. Sure. Yeah, yeah, expression of a phenotype or whatever expression of the phenotype because you can go, oh, that's a white wall, yeah. or oh, that's a, a brindle, but a lot of the same things may be involved in that animal. I can live with phenotype. We'll just call it phenotype. Morph, it like works more for like the ball python community where you call something a like a Pompeii and it has like six different traits in it, right? So yeah, that, that's one other thing like, like morph can just be one name for an animal that has multiple traits. So like, uh, and there's a lot of even like wild type, uh, what are they called? Uh, spiny tails that are out there. You got like the banana and the and the and the pied, right? Pectinata, like those are technically polymorphic kind of animals because there's multiple wild types out there. I find this very interesting. Anthony works with spiny tails, spiny tail iguanas. I don't know anybody else who does that. Uh, very cool species, underrepresented. You want to talk about them a little bit because they are cool. Uh, yeah. So we first started getting into them with the utilas. They're awesome they're super intelligent we also have tegus like uh, i think somewhere around nine of them right now nice um and then for the spiny tails we have roatan utila uh pied pectinata we're getting bananas and we have defensor but the cool thing is is they're super intelligent animals and like some of them are actually a good majority of the ones that we have uh we just towel train them which means we get a towel we put it on our hand and they see that and they know to come out and they'll just come straight out, hop on the towel. If they don't see a towel, then they're going to be fed usually like um, like a whole prey animal. Uh, so like tegu, our tegus do that, right? They know that if they see a towel, they're going to come out, they're going to get a bath, they're going to get fed. So they're like trained, if you will. And the, the spiny tails seem to take to that same exact training really well. They're awesome animals. I absolutely love them. Very cool. And they, they're somewhat just chill. They're kind of calm. For yeah, the most yeah, part, yeah. I mean, we took them out. They hang out on our bed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Crazy, because I the ones that I saw back a long time ago, probably wild caught or whatever, and they were just crazy and you know kind of bad tempered. But yeah. yeah, yeah. We have a pair of Roatan though that they are kind of crazy. Okay. Those guys are, are bananas, <laughs> but they're super fun. They're beautiful. They have this like velvet black color when they shed. It's so deep. Nice. Nice. Man. Tom, you working with anything else besides crested geckos? What are you What are you getting into? Oh, I keep lychees. I'm dealing with uh, parthenogenesis. Been doing right. that for I don't know a lot of years. years. Yeah, uh, uh, that's been... another episode. We could have an episode on that, man. Oh yeah, it's it's confirmed. <laughs> yeah, there's things they're looking into where they have to dig even deeper into the genome. Huh. Um, 
they know that's what it is. It might be something completely unique at this point. No kidding. So instead of, you know, when you do genomes, you, you break it down into chunks, but yeah. now they're having to get into details within it. So there's so much information in there. Yeah. So years again. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think we could definitely dedicate some time to that one in the future here yeah. for sure. I think that's yeah, cool. and you guys, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do a whole another episode of this just to get kind of this out of the way. Yep. <laughs> Not out of the way; it's very yeah. interesting. We, but can, we get this out of the way. I want to talk about parthenogenesis. But we, we can go for days on this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. If no, so episode two coming soon. Uh, Anthony awesome. might even be coming over from Utah, California to Utah to here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, but uh, we'll see you next time. Right. Thanks. Sounds good. See you guys. All right. Bye.